And joining us now in studio, Alison Motlock, science journalist who's covering Canada's assisted reproductive technology debate for many different publications. It's good to have you in that chair. Thank you. You're going to, because we're going to have a debate on this later, but you're going to essentially set the table for us and help us understand all of the issues in play here. Okay. So, assisted human reproduction essentially means what? Essentially it means uh, when an individual wants to have a child and they can't do it without medical help. So, for instance, IVF, very common uh, treatment. In vitro fertilization. In vitro fertilization. Test babies, I guess they used to call them. Take the egg out of the woman, some sperm out of the man, put them together in a glass dish. They fertilize, and a few days later, you can, you can place that embryo back into the woman's body. There are a whole host of contentious issues associated with doing that, what seemingly is a very simple procedure. So let's start. Okay. Donor anonymity. Why well, is this important? Donor anonymity comes up when maybe the egg or the sperm isn't your own, and so you have to borrow it from someone else. And the question is, does the offspring, the child, the person resulting from this, have the right to know who that person is, who's their biological parent? Do they at the moment? No. They uh, don't. Under Canadian law, you don't, you, donors are anonymous, can be anonymous, and offspring have no right to know. Uh, that has been challenged in BC by one young woman, uh, Olivia Pratton, who uh, has won in the, in the BC Supreme Court uh, the right that adoptees have to find out who her biological father is. Unfortunately, her records are already gone, but for subsequent uh, people, they will, should be available. So we'll follow that one through. How about financial compensation? Where, where is that at nowadays? Uh, the Canadian law says that, and I'm going to use the word payment, because compensation and payment sometimes are used differently in reproductive uh, areas, but payment is not allowed. You're not allowed to, to pay a donor or a surrogate for their services. We were supposed to know if you were allowed to compensate them for, say, lost, uh, you know, lost work or, or some cost that came to them in the act of donating. Uh, we never did find out about what was allowed. Regulation of the industry. When we talk about the industry, who are we talking about? Uh, we're mostly talking about fertility doctors. And um, a lot of people argue that they can self-regulate. Um, a lot of other people, maybe more people, would say, no, we, this is a pretty important area and we need, we need very clear guidelines about what's acceptable and not acceptable. So when you say docs, you're talking about in hospitals or private clinics? Or? Mo it's mostly private uh, mm -hmm. reproductive medicine. Okay. Uh, why are we having an argument in this country, have been actually for a long time now, right? 1989 this all started, this yes. debate. Why have we been having an argument about this? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, one reason is people don't agree. There are a lot of different interests that come to play here. Um, there, are, there are parents who legitimately want to, to create families. There are doctors uh, who want to help them create families. There are offspring who have rights that we didn't even acknowledge in the beginning that we're now starting to acknowledge. There are donors who are a special class of people who are, are undergoing procedures to help other people. They need to be protected. It's very hard to, to square that circle. It's a brave new world. Yeah. I mentioned 1989 a second ago, and I'm going to ask our director, Michael Smith, to bring up this graphic, because here is some of, this is where this all starts for us in Canada. 1989, uh, the Mulroney government appoints a royal commission on r new reproductive technologies, and it begins its work in 1989. It lasts for four years at a cost of $28 million. In November 93, it releases its final report called Proceed with Care. It's also called the Baird Report after its chair, geneticist Dr. Patricia Baird. 1,275 pages two volumes, 293 recommendations. I don't expect you, Allison, to tell us what all 293 recommendations suggested, but the gist of it was what? Well, one gist of it was that uh, you should not be paying people for um, reproductive material. This was one of the very strongly felt outcomes. Um, you shouldn't be paying for eggs, you shouldn't be paying for sperm, you shouldn't be paying for surrogacy. So they attempted to put some boundaries, some clear boundaries in place as to what was good, what was okay, and what wasn't. They did attempt that. They did attempt that. Okay. So that was the attempt. Yeah. Conservatives lost power. Liberals came in, I think, actually, in November of 1993. And what happened? Attempts were made to create a law. Um, some of them didn't get off to much of a start, died on the order paper. Uh, eventually, uh, they started working on a law. I think it was in 2001. And finally, in 2004, after much uh, changing of the committee opinion and the, the parliamentary opinion, a law was created, the Assisted Human Reproduction Act. In 2004? Yes. So this starts in 1989, and it takes until 2004 to actually get a law crafted. And the story gets worse. 
<laughs> because the law, the law came into force, um, but a law, the law needed regulation. So they, the law said what we wanted to achieve. It didn't say how we were going to achieve it, and that was going to be the regulations. Most of those regulations n never occurred. We, ne we never found out how it was we were supposed to, to enforce the law. Um, part of that was that Quebec uh, challenged the, uh, the law and said mm -hmm. that basically, you know, you're not so, the federal government should not be in this Keep your nose provincial out of our area. Business. Yeah. Exactly. Um, that finally, the Supreme Court finally answered on that. Uh, that last was the 441 decision. That's right. Which was not all that helpful, I guess, in the long range. I mean, ultimately, we still have a situation where we don't know what's allowed and not allowed, and there's a lot of confusion. Right. Now, is, is it this way because, like capital punishment, like abortion, this is just too hot a topic and politicians don't want to touch it? Apparently, there is a bit of that. I mean, there's certainly, there is the feeling that this is a, you're going to make somebody unhappy. Uh, if you touch this, but I mean, it's an important issue. It's uh, important issue, but but maybe too complicated to find a consensus around. I, I think we can. I mean, there are other places that find consensus. Um, I mean, European nations uh, have some. They, they have regulations that many different nations are following. I mean, I don't know why it is that we can't. We're going to have to sit down and, and we're going to have to find a way to make something work. Okay, let's read a little excerpt here from. Um, you did a piece in the Walrus Magazine about a year and a half ago, and I want to read a little excerpt from that. In the years since the act was passed, however, Canada has found itself in the uncomfortable position of banning the purchase of gametes, sperm eggs, in principle, but not in practice. Other countries, such as the UK, also ban their purchase, but have strict enforcement provisions backing the ban. The Canadian law, by contrast, was never completed. The sections dealing with prohibited activities, like the sale of eggs, are done and in force, but certain parts dealing with activities that are allowed but controlled, including the reimbursement of donor expenses, can't be proclaimed until regulations are produced setting out the details of how the system will work. Those regulations are still pending six years later. Why? Well, the argument, the government argued, said that they weren't going to bring out the regulations until uh, they heard from the Supreme Court. And so we sat and sat and sat and nothing, nothing came out. I've heard, I mean, I, maybe the regulations were difficult to produce as well. It took many years. Uh, I mean, it was the, the Supreme, the Quebec challenge didn't occur immediately. Uh, we, we, time went by without anything being, uh, any re regulations coming out, so. Hmm. Do you see a, a consensus on this issue coming anytime soon? Well. Uh, I think that it's going to be province by province, largely, at this point. So there will be no national rules in place dealing with all of these issues that we've been talking about? Well, it looks as though at least part of this uh, reproductive technology is going to be governed by the province. I mean, the licensing of clinics is, is going to be province by province, and uh, information collection is going to be province by province. There's still an argument to have an overarching federal uh, mm -hmm some kind of federal agreement. Um, I mean, because what we're going to see if we have province by province is we're going to see people migrating between provinces well, to get a, the, the things that they feel they need. There's a phrase for that, right? Reproductive tourism. And That's I mean, we already see Canadians right now going to the States or going to other countries uh, to seek the services that they can't get here. Mm -hmm. And to see that happen within our own country could also be problematic. Let's finish on this. You followed somebody to the Czech Republic. Yes, I did because they wanted to do what? Well, she was a, a, a woman who wanted to have a family. Um, her own eggs were not usable. Uh, she wanted, she, she didn't have anyone to give her eggs in Canada, so she, she went to the Czech Republic. She, she, she purchased uh, eggs and sperm and uh, IVF service and came home pregnant and uh, has given, gave birth to two lovely children. So, good news story, happy ending? Well, you know, ultimately, it's a very happy ending, I think. Um, she's very happy. Her children are lovely. Uh, in the, I mean, for her, uh, her physician uh, at home, it was probably rather difficult because she'd had this procedure done outside of the country. Um, it, was a, it was a twin pregnancy, and they, those are always more challenging. Um, her children at birth both had to stay in the hospital for some time, so I suppose there were some bumps along the way. And she avoided all of the ethical and legal and moral and political considerations by leaving the country. That's right. And that's the bottom line today. One of the bottom lines today. One of the bottom lines.